And this evening is The Lost Art of Scripture. And this is an article based by, this is based on an article by Karen Armstrong in Tricycle of Buddhist Review, summer 2020, which was an adaptation of her book by the same name. I wanted to discuss the book, The Lost Art of Reading Scriptures, Rescuing the Sacred Text, when it first came out about a year ago. However, condensing a 500 plus page book into a 45 minute in-person or a 20 minute Zoom presentation is not fair to the author, intimidating to me. Even the adapted article is difficult because there are so many interesting paths that branch off from the main topic of the uh, of main trail of the topic. This evening, we will not be discussing scripture as literature, as knowledge to be attained, or even, even historic mythos, though we may refer to all of these along the way. And I'm following the flow of Armstrong's article in Tricycle, but I'm using the book to expand on and provide a fuller understanding of the article. Also, some of the points I make are my own interpretation of Armstrong's thesis, such as several that I will now make. The sacred has been called a more enhanced state of being. Scripture as sacred text is therefore a process, to paraphrase Frederick String, whereby people reach beyond themselves to connect with the true and ultimate reality that will save them from the destructive forces of everyday existence. What qualifies as scripture? The following is both literal and rewording of Armstrong. A scripture can be defined as a text that is regarded as sacred often, but not always, because it was divinely revealed. The for, the, and forms part of an author, authoritative canon. The word scripture in English implies a written text, but most scriptures begin as texts that were composed and transmitted orally. Indeed, in some traditions, the sound of the inspired words, and we'll talk about that later, would always be more important than their semantic meaning. Further, scripture was usually sung, chanted, or declaimed in a way that separates it from mundane speech. Even after scripture became a written text, people often regarded it as inert until it was ignited by living voice. I was therefore, it was therefore essentially a performative art. And until the modern period, it was almost always acted out in the drama of ritual and belonged to the world of myth. Scriptures are, re are very often revered and they are often regarded today as fossilized, the last word for all eternity. However, I would argue that scripture is a dynamic process. Historically, they are regularly repurposed to provide comfort or insight for new challenges. The Quran is perpetually new, argued Mu'id ad bin Ilad Arabi, who died in 1240. He went so far as to add that anyone who recited a verse in the same way twice had not understood it correctly. The final point I will make for now is that kenosis is a central scriptural theme. Kenosis is the emptying of self. In fact, this will sound familiar to the Buddhists in the group. And the best way to transcend the self is to cultivate habits of empathy and compassion. And further, that one cannot confine benevolence to one's own people, but must honor the stranger and even your enemy. The orientation to the book, hence the article. From the article, the deep-seated yearning for transcendence and transformation is a major theme of scripture, as are descriptions of ways of achieving these. Today, we are less ambitious than we were through most of our past. We want to be slimmer, healthier, younger, and more attractive than we really are. We feel that a better self lurks beneath our lamentably, lamentably, lamentably imperfect one. We want to be kinder, braver, excuse me, uh, more brilliant and charismatic. But scriptures go further. Cosmos and society. Armstrong sets us up in part one of the book to look at Israel, India, and China. These centers of civilization created and developed very different forms of scripture, consistent with the differences in beliefs about life in the universe 
held by each of these cultural regions. Part two is mythos, provides us with the central themes that we find in each of the preceding elements of cosmos and society, explored through scripture, which is myth, history, and aspiration. And there's logos. There are two longer chapters to the book. And in this part, they discuss why scriptures are largely misunderstood today. And then finally, there is a chapter by itself titled Post Scripture. And this chapter discusses what we can do to recapture the art of scripture. If I were to provide a summary of Armstrong's presentation, it would be as follows. To see a world in a grain of sand and the heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour by William Blake. And of course, when we go on to cosmos and society, we then start with Israel, remembering in order to belong. Israel is a reference to the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Scripture emerged when human beings started to live in larger and more complex societies and needed a common ethos that bound them together. The earliest civilizations were found in the Middle East in the fourth century millennium BCE. At that time, all states and empires were based economically in agriculture and were being maintained only by ruthless exploitation of the penitent peasants. A small aristocracy and retain their retainers seized all the surplus grown by the peasants and forced 90% of the population to live at a subsistence level. It's this that created a privileged class with leisure to create arts and sciences on which progress depended. One of the civilized arts was scripture, and it depended upon the civilized science of ritual in the pre-modern world. The narratives were intended to bind the people to Yahweh and later to Jesus Christ and later yet to Muhammad. They presented a world of deliverance from the brutal world around them. India, sound and silence, refers to the Indian subcontinent, which includes everything to the everything over to Persia in the west, north to Tibet and China, and east to what is today Burma. This area was settled around 1500 BCE by people from the Khausian steppes and settled in what is now Pakistan, the Punjab. These are the so-called Aryan groups of people. The Rig Veda was the earliest scripture. Rig Veda is translated as knowledge in verse. These hymns, though largely incomprehensible to people today, are still recited with precise tonal accents and inflections of the original, together with the richly prescribed gestures of the arms and figures. And of course, we know that from this region, Buddhism also arose around the fifth century BCE. In India, the recitation of mantra is used to achieve the transition from the worldly analytic left hemisphere of the brain to a deeper and more intuitive form of consciousness. The meaning of the words is not important because the mantra is symbolic and points to something other than itself. It is rather the physical vibrations of the recitations that over time stills one, the rational activity of the brain. China, we have the primacy of ritual. Again, in China, we are referring to East Asia, including what is today China, and to a broader extent, Korea, Japan, uh, and Vietnam. Sometimes, in fact, ritual was regarded as far more important than, scriptural, than scripture. Traditions such as Chan or Zen Buddhism find scripture entirely dispensable. But the ritual was really discarded in part in the past, those reformers who rejected the ceremony or rituals of their day nearly always replaced them with new rites. The Buddha, for example, had no time for the Brahmins, elaborate Vedic sacrifices, but required his monks to do so to ritualize their everyday physical actions in the way they walked, spoke, or washed and expressed moral beauty and grace. The second part of Armstrong's book is Mythos. 
This is the longest and most detailed part of the book, consisting of almost half the body of the book. Each chapter is worthy of a presentation in and of itself. This picture is El Brujo in, in France. Um, actually, it must be, if it's El Brujo, it must be in Spain. Now I'm confused. As soon as the first humans learned to manipulate tools, they created works of art to make sense of the terror, wonder, and mystery of their existence. From the very beginning, art was inextricably bound up with what we call religion, which is itself an art form. And I was right, this photo is from the Lascaux Caves, a cultic site since 1700 BCE. This hybrid, hybrid creature transcends anything in our empirical experience, but seems to reflect a sense of the underlying unity of animal, human, and divine. <clears throat> from the very beginning, men and women deliberately cultivate a perception of existence that differed from the empirical. Humans have an instinctive appetite for the sacred, for a more enhanced state of being. The myths, rituals, oops, sorry about that. The myths, rituals, sacred text, and ethical practices of religion develop a plan of action whereby people reach beyond themselves to connect with the true and ultimate reality. It will save them from the destructive forces of everyday existence. Living with what is ultimately real and true, people have found that they are not only better able to bear these destructive tensions, but that life itself acquires new depth and purpose. The myths of scripture are not designed to confirm your beliefs, rather they are calling for radical transformation of mind and heart. This picture is of Gyogen, the 18th century Zasu, chief abbot of Enrakuji in the 10th century. It is said to be a portrait of him subjugating vengeful, vengeful ghosts. These myths are a way of envisaging the mysterious reality of the world that we cannot grasp conceptually. Myths come alive when enacted in ritual without which they can seem abstract and even alien. Myth and ritual are so intertwined that it is a matter of scholarly debate as to which came first, the mythical story or the rites attached to it. The third part of the book is Logos. Our modern, our modern society is rooted in logos or reason, which must relate precisely to factual, objective, and imperial reality if it is to function efficiently in the world. The prevalence of logos in modern society and education has made scripture problematic. In the early West, people began to read the narratives of the Bible as though they were logi, factual accounts of what happened. Sola Scripta. Scripture alone is authoritative for faith and practice. Scriptural narratives never claim to be accurate descriptions of the creation of the world, the evolution of the species, exact historical bi biographies, etc. Precise historical writing is a recent phenomenon. We seem to forget that these days, that myth itself is, was never in the scriptures, I should say, scriptures themselves were never intended initially to be authoritative. I might get some pushback from this and I'll be happy to, to explore that with other people. So, solo racia, uh, sola racia, the deconstruction of faith and belief. For our simple ideas, which are the foundations and sole matter of all our notions and knowledge, we must depend wholly on our reason. I mean, our natural faculties and can be no means received, excuse me, and can by no means receive them or any of them from traditional revelation. And that comes from Spinoza. From the Stan Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Baruch Spinoza is one of the most important philosophers in the early modern period. His extremely naturalistic views of God, the world, the human being and knowledge serve to ground a moral philosophy centered on the control of the passions leading to virtue and happiness. 
They also lay the foundation for a strongly democratic political thought and a deep critique of the pretensions of the scripture and sectarian religion. Of all the philosophers of the 17th century, some Spinoza is among the most relevant today. And we, just as a side note, he was raised in a Sephardic Portuguese community in Amsterdam, and he developed highly controversial ideas regarding the authenticity of the Hebrew Bible and the nature of the divine. As a matter of fact, he was cast out from the Jewish community as a heretic. This is the guy who we can point to and say, he did it. Dealing with the post-scripture, in many ways, we seem to be losing the art of scripture in our modern world. Instead of reading it to achieve transformation, we use it to confirm our own views, either that our religion is right and that of our enemies wrong, or in the case of skeptics, that religion is unworthy of serious consideration. Scripture has never yielded clear un univocal messages or lucid inconvertible doctrines. On the contrary, scripture was usually regarded as an indication that one can only point to the ineffable. Sometimes it even forces us to experience the shock of total unknowing. We see this as just one example in which India's most popular scriptures, Mahabharata, which induces a spiritual and conceptual vertigo of Mah or, excuse me, induces spiritual or conceptual vertigo or Mahayana Buddhism, which rigorously rejected essentialism and produced a multifarious canon demonstrated insistently that our most basic assumptions about the world were untenable. Conclusions. The purpose of scripture was not to confirm the reader or listener in their firmly held opinions, but to transform them, transform them utterly. The art of scripture demanded that it issued positive practical actions. Otherwise, it was stopped. Its natural dynamic frustrated. In India, Buddha devised a form of yoga in which the practitioner extended loving kindness to all quarters of the world until she had achieved a state of perfect equanimity and impartiality toward all creatures. The Quran gave Muslims a divine mission to create a just and compassionate society in which wealth was shared fairly and the poor and vulnerable were treated with respect. In modern secular society, the privatization of faith has overturned the dynamic intention of this scriptural genre. Secularization, separation of religion and politics could have benefited religion by liberating it from the inherent injustice of the state, but it has not inspired a prof prophetic critique of the society. Instead, by reducing religion to a private search, it seems to have subjectified and even trivialized the art of scripture. Instead of extirpating egotism from the psyche, yoga has become an aerobic exercise or means of easing personal tension and improving flexibility. Mindfulness designed to teach Buddhist anatta, not self, that the self we prize so dearly as illusory and non-existence is now used to help people feel more centered and comfortable in themselves. The old scriptural ideas of kenosis seems to be in abeyance. Scripture when practiced as art is language made numinous. Scriptures are as they have always been works in progress, which draw on the past to give meaning to the present. The message of scripture is not cast in stone and no scriptural text has all the answers. Even the inspired words of scripture must eventually segue into silence. That is an expression of awe, wonder, and unknowing. And these are some of the sources I use for this evening's discussion. And I will unmute everyone to see if you have any questions. 
Yes, Monshin, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what do you mean by private search and how it's changed now in our modern society into a private search of religion? What, isn't, can't you, can it be viewed that anyone chooses a spiritual path as being ultimately the private kind of decision that can't be imposed? No, that's, or, really, that's, that's really a 20th, well, maybe a 19th century, starting in the 19th century. That started in the 19th century. If you look at Robert Bella's writings, he argues that the idea of spiritual versus religion is that spiritual is actually the search for something which is a privatized, monetized activity, that religion requires other people. And religion requires you to look beyond the self into and encompass everyone else. So the privatization oh, okay. of religion is really a, a very, I, I, should un, I should make myself video here. Um, yeah, you're videoized now. Yeah. I'm videoized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the idea of privatization of religion is really a rather recent by comparison to, you know, geologic time is really a rather recent phenomenon. Uh, so private in the sense of, oh, for in, in our purpose, for example, not thinking of the Sangha, not even thinking maybe of the, oh, definitely not thinking of the Sangha, but just thinking that, oh, this is mine. I'm going to sit at home and I'm going to meditate and read books and that's all I need versus okay, that, that having would the be, whole community. That, that would be one large. aspect of it. Another, another aspect of it is that I'm the center of the universe. My faith is my faith. I don't need to share with anybody else, and I don't need to get it from anybody else. I thought of it all by myself. That would be another okay. extension of that. Because when I uh, see the private search and, and poking holes in that, it almost seems like then... <laughs> seeing it from the other angle that okay if it's not private then can't there be a risk that it could be imposed on you as well if it's not private if it's a community imposing it on you for example if you're raised in a certain kind of faith-based community you don't want that you don't it doesn't resonate with you say for example but then you're right. forced to do these rituals forced to do this even though you don't agree with it is that a, a different uh, prong of of, of this, or is it linked similar, similarly to, to what you're saying? Well, I, I think what, you, what you're describing is, is a little bit, is not a little bit, it's, it's very different. Okay. And the, 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 private, the private, and don't get me wrong, each of us is attracted to or rejects a particular religious tradition for whatever reasons, that, you know, who knows how many reasons. What we're talking about here is that, well, let me, let me back up for a second. The notion of I as what am I doing, and I'm, I'm sure I mentioned this in one of your classes at, at Simon's Rock. <laughs> you know, if you go to um, pre-postmodern societies, and certainly pre-industrial societies, you go to a little village someplace in Italy in the 16th century or in Japan in the 17th century, et cetera, People didn't think about just what do I want. They thought about the fact that they represent not only themselves, but they're doing things for their parents. They're doing it for the neighborhood. They're doing it for the people around them. That the I, as we use it today currently, is really a, a modern and postmodern notion. The mm -hmm. pre-modern notion really was that of we. And so I remember in, in classes asking some of the people who were coming from um, Burma or from um, Thailand, why did you choose Simon's Rock? And you know what their answer was? Well, I thought that I could make my father really pleased to see that I had graduated from such a good college. Or if I went here, then later I hope that I can help my sisters or my brothers or my cousins, whomever, to do such and such with their lives. If I asked most of the, the students from the States, why did they go to Simon's Rock? They would reply, well, I couldn't really stand high school anymore, or I, um, the food, the, 
I, I'm making this up, but the food service was good. <laughs> you know, the, the dorms are nice. You know, <laughs> it's close to mom and dad, so I can go home periodically. Very different orientation. It's a very different orientation. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Machin. Yes. Uh, don't you see a parallel in terms of contemporary politics? <laughs> This whole notion of individualism, it's my right not to wear a mask. It's my right to do this. It, it, huh? Isn't that well, I'm glad, parallel? I'm glad that somebody else raised the issue. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so so my, reason for, my reason for looking at scripture was not in vain. <laughs> it, I, think, I think there is a direct parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Chodin. I'm wondering if the comparison that you were making before about the, the spiritual path or the individualized and personal one, was that the path of the Pratyeka Bodhas? That would have been. Well, I don't, you know, now that you mean, I was going to say sort of reflexively, yes, but I'm not sure that that was totally true. Yeah. Uh, because the, the Pratekya Buddhas also really, um, they didn't require the other. And that's, that's part of the, re that's one of the reasons that they were seen as separate from uh, the Bodhisattvas that come later. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not only that they saw themselves that way, because at the time that those texts were being written, the idea of the I as a solitary individual didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that, that it could have referred to the Pratikya Buddhas. The Pratikya Buddhas, for those who may not know, were those who attain um, awakening by their own methods. They don't require a teacher, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Yes, Mushin. Yeah. Um, when I was visiting South India, I had the opportunity to see Katakali dancers. These are people that uh, dance the Mahabharata and recite it in costume as a, in, as a religious experience. Mm -hmm. And it's quite something. And it's from a definitely a different era. <laughs> well, from a diff different era, but I'm not sure that the people who are doing it today don't receive the same benefit as somebody who was doing it a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. You know? Yeah, and it's, well, it's done for the benefit of the oh. audience, so. Well, it's a, but it's done for both. It's done for both yeah. the, the, the right. participants as well as the audience, I would say, yeah. Any other questions? Job, I'm wondering how, how your view of scripture might differ from this since Job is a scriptural authority. Oh, of what scriptures? I'll let, I'll let Job explain. Yeah, I specialize in Hebrew Bible and ancient Mesopotamian, uh, <laughs> ancient Mesopotamian texts. Um, I think you presented uh, the subject beautifully. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Spinoza is a complex is a complex figure, right? Um, yes. <laughs> right. Um, he is the one who created uh, the modern notion or introduced the modern notion of public sphere as neutral. And, and that allowed us to believe whatever we want to, in a way. Right. But at the same time, and, and he allowed us to criticize scripture with reason. But, but just one problem I have with Spinoza is that he seems to, see, he seems to think about religion as within limits of reason. And not right. beyond, right. and not beyond, and, and that legacy mm -hmm. is is really challenging. Yeah, 
Yeah, that, that's why I think Armstrong is, spends a fair amount of time on Spinoza. And just reading in other materials about scripture, you, you see his name come up consistently because he was one of the main critics of religion as it was being practiced during his time. Yeah, and of course, you know, he was being influenced by, by others, you know, Hobbes and, and uh, uh, you know, others that were feeding that, that whole idea of scripture as a reasoned process. And I would argue, as, as Armstrong does, that scripture is a beyond reason process. Yeah. Yes, when? That was, just, that was just very hard to, for the enlightenment to stomach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I agree. When, you had your hand okay. up. Yeah. Uh I wrote down a sentence that I really that that stood out to me, um, and it said, "Scripture requires the disciplined cultivation of an appropriate mode of consciousness, uh, as does any artwork." And I, 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 that idea, the idea of, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the care, the character required of us that those. Uh, uh, Dana, uh, all the you know basic uh, ideas are, are are methods of of cultivating character, mm -hmm. um, and that's what this sounded like to me an appropriate appropriate model of consciousness. Yeah, I yeah. think that's correct. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I liked it. <laughs> Thank you. You're Anyone welcome. else? Can I can I add one one more thing? Um, oh sure, Joe. Go ahead. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, the transformative function of scripture, uh, and I'm here generalizing, but I I I, I see that there's a tendency. How do I say this? A distinction between people in the West, so to speak, and people in the East uh, mm -hmm. think about this aspect. Right. Uh, so a uh, comparative religion, uh, scholars of comparative religion mm -hmm. have shown us that almost every scripture has two functions. One is the cultivation of mindfulness. The other is the transformation of the self. So, mm -hmm. so the more you read the scripture, uh, the more you cultivate a certain quality of mindfulness and you begin to notice dimensions of reality you have never noticed before. That's yeah. cultivation of mindfulness and transformation of, of the self is that the more you read a, a scripture, the more you cultivate in you a new identity and you emerge as a new self, so to speak. So uh, this means that the real content of the, a, a given scripture is not within the scripture. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. The real content is outside of it or what we begin to see through the scripture in our daily lives. The, the scripture becomes a vehicle. Right, mm -hmm. and this, this approach is very, how do I say this? It, it, it's found, foundational in the East. <laughs> yes, but I agree. The more often than not, not, especially among my Christian fellows, I see that they try to find the content in the text <laughs> instead right. of through the text. Right. I well, that's the whole basis of fundamentalism. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear you, Gary. It, that, that, I, I think he's just hit on the, the basis of fundamentalism in Christianity. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and the fact that the text is authoritative and can never change over time. Right, right. Yeah. Right. But I, I think that, that just going along with what Joe was, was just speaking to, I think that this also suggests to us that we read, when we read scripture, I don't care whether it's sutra, whether it's Tanakh, or whether it's Quran, whatever it happens to be, if we read it without opening ourselves up and letting the ego go as we read it, then we're never going to be to really be informed by it. It's just, a, it, we're just, we may be gaining knowledge, but we're not really allowing it to flow through us. And so to me, kenosis is really essential in this. 
letting go of the self as we read the material yeah. is one of the essential aspects of reading scripture. That's part of the art of reading scripture, I think. Yeah. Anyone else got a question or a comment? If not, I'll move us along. Oh, Mark, did you have a question? Yes, I, I've been trying to follow the conversation and I appreciate it. Um, and my question is, so if scripture informs us and enhances our understanding of our relationship with the whole and not just the text, but the meaning, then I wonder to what degree when scripture challenges us to acknowledge, to understand our relationship with the whole, with others, and challenges us with regard to justice. Uh, how, uh, what are the challenges of us embodying that, that challenge, that, that uh, in effect, invitation to uh, uh, embrace those values in our, in our world, in our lives, beyond, beyond ourselves. That, and I, that's the work I, that's what I work with, I think most, many of us do. And I wonder what, uh, what we can gain mm -hmm from that, uh, how we can embody that val those values into our lives, not just I, into our consciousness. Well, I, I, think, I think you hit on it because last week during the Dharma talk, I talked, I talked about anger, that many people say, I use anger because it makes me, um, it gets me riled up when I go out and I do something, meaning social justice, something. And I argue that, no, if you need to get angry to do what's right, then you're not reading the right things. You're not, you're not studying a scripture. Because to me, when I read scripture, almost any scripture from any tradition, as far as I know, and there obviously are some traditions perhaps I'm not aware of or I haven't read, but almost any scripture that I've, I'm aware of, social justice is inherent in them. I mean, it's, it's part of what it is. And, and I, I would suggest that it, it forces us to look at not only, not our beliefs necessarily, but our actions. Because our beliefs are less important in that respect than our actions are, you know, I would suggest. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna move us along. So I'm going to mute everyone just because I can. This evening's discussion was on scripture, not specifically Buddhist scripture, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jain, Zoroastrian, Sikh, etc., but scriptures writ large. And I've always been fascinated with canonical works, and I never felt that I have to believe what is being written in them, but I recognize that there is wisdom to be found in those tracts. And there is something fascinating about the stories, the parables, the poetry, the imagery. One aspect that resonates within these texts is the problem of suffering is at the heart of most spiritual inquiry. When I apply this to Buddhism, immediately I think of dukkha, which is sometimes translated as suffering, but also discontentedness, sorrow. A basic premise of Buddhism is that following the teachings is a way to mitigate dukkha. Dukkha will still be with us. It's a consequence of living but we can reduce the intensity and frequency of dukkha. Armstrong quotes Frederick Strang, the American scholar who wrote Emptiness, A Study of Religious Meaning, and another work, Understanding Religious Life, among many other uh, articles and books. Strang's definition of religion is a means of ultimate transformation. An ultimate transformation is a fundamental change from being caught up in the troubles of common existence, such as sin and ignorance, to living in such a way that one can cope at the deepest level with these troubles. That capacity for living allows one to experience the most authentic, deepest reality, the ultimate, unquote. I like this definition. It's a theological understanding of religion for sure, but not one that a social scientist would use necessarily, but one that is good for religious practitioners of any religion. 
I don't go out of my way to look for commonalities between different religions, but I do go out of my way to find what is common that can join people together. Each religious tradition has its own set of beliefs, practices, and teachings that set it apart from the other traditions. It is important for us to remember during this time of divisiveness and pol polarization that we as humans have more in common with each other than we have as differences. Studying scripture that spans the religious spectrum is an important way of bringing home our similarities and our commonalities. A search for the sacred is part of being human. For many of us, a search for the sacred is a search for the nature reality, the ultimate, the absolute. To quote Armstrong again, until the modern period, it was taken for granted in all cultures and the world who create the, was created by and experiences, excuse me, that all cultures that the world was created by and found its explanations in a reality that exceeded the reach of the intellect. In the modern world, we may not cultivate that sense of transcendent as assiduously as our forefathers or forebearers, perhaps would be a better term, but we have all known moments when we are touched deeply within, seemed lifted momentarily beyond our everyday lives and inhabit our humanity more fully than usual. I hope this evening's discussion inspires you to investigate the scriptures, not for explanation, but for inspiration, not for answers, but to experience awe and wonder. And I wanna thank you for indulging me this evening in my perusal of this fascinating subject. And thank you for being a member of this humble Sangha. Svaha. The old gods are dead or dying and the people everywhere are searching, asking, what is the new mythology to be? The mythology of this unified earth as one harmonious being by Joseph Campbell. And I will be unmuting everyone. Well, everyone, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I appreciate your diligence and your practice. And it's good to see everyone's face. If we can't be together in person, in the temple, we can at least be together in spirit and join with each other by our voices and by our thoughts. I hope that everyone enjoys the upcoming snow for those who are going to get it. And for those that don't, geez, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next week we'll be doing the um, winter solstice service. So join us for that next week. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Moshe. Thank you so much and have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mommy. Wait a second. Wait. Win. Oh, wait. Thank you. Where's the joke? Oh, wait, wait, wait. We need a joke. Where's the joke? The cartoon says the cartoon. it's called reading. It's how people install new software into their brains. <laughs> That's a good one. If only it were that easy. Yes. Go in <laughs> peace they did. and relax in place. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.